Hi everyone, John Lindsay here, uh, co-founder of Whitebox Geospatial Inc. Uh, today I'd like to talk to you about a new tool that we've recently added to the general toolset extension of Whitebox Tools. And that tool is called the River Centerline tool. So River Centerline tool right here. And again, this is part of the Whitebox toolset extension product that we sell. Um, so this tool essentially can be used to map the medial lines or center lines of, of rivers based on an input raster water uh, polygon file. And um, so today what I'd like to do, if we can, is to give you a bit of a demonstration in terms of how you'd go about using this tool to generate a, a river center line uh, data set. Commonly speaking, you would normally, as an input, obviously have, well, you always have a water raster, and in terms of where you would derive that from, it would normally be from a multispectral image data set, whether that be a satellite image data set or a, a set of, um, of air photos. And so for the demonstration today, all I've done is downloaded a Sentinel-2 image data set, and this is a shortwave infrared uh, color composite and you can see that there are in fact several streams, including some larger streams and some sort of side streams that are considerably smaller in this particular uh, data set, as well as some larger water bodies that maybe I'm a little less concerned with mapping the medial lines of, but uh, certainly these streams I, I am quite concerned with. So I'm gonna give you a bit of a demonstration in terms of how this works, but the starting point for us is obviously to generate a water raster. And for that, I'm going to use a supervised classification. Uh, and the supervised classification technique obviously requires that we create a, a training data set of water. So I've done this ahead of time where I have digitized a number of water polygons. And just so you can see, in this particular data set, there are a great many, oops, different types of water. So along the stream in particular, we have a lot of turbid water. Um, and this would be water that contains a fair amount of sediment and therefore appears quite a bit lighter in the satellite imagery. And it's quite different in terms of its spectral characteristics than what we have with, say, deep water and some of the larger water bodies. So I've actually digitized all of the different representations of water within the image ahead of time in terms of a number of training data sets to help us in terms of being able to map the map the, the water as uh, in contrast to the land in this raster. So to do this, I am going to use a classification technique um, known as parallelly piped, and I could um, extract that from the white box uh, QGIS front end. So I could use the tool as it is here in the white box QGIS front end, but my preference these days is uh, honestly to use a different front end for running the tools, and that's the white box runner. So that equivalent tool is found here in image processes, uh, processing tools, and the classification sub toolbox, parallelly pipe. This is a, again an image classification tool that's available in the general tool set extension of white box tools. There are, as you can see, a, a number of tools available for image classification as well as um, several machine learning algorithms for classification like the random forest method that would be perhaps a bit more advanced as a classifier than what parallelly piped normally would be considered. However, the parallelly piped tool for us has one main advantage, and that is that it allows us, um, when it encounters pixels that don't fit very well to any of the classes in our training data set, to assign those pixels a no data or background value. They, get, they left, are left unassigned effectively. Many of the other image classifiers, they assume that every pixel needs to be assigned to at least, well, to one of the training set categories. And, um, and that is not what we want, because we want to create a water map and everything else. So sort of a water Boolean, if you think of it that way. And so I'm going to use the parallelly piped classification technique because it's a simple classifier that does have that characteristic. So I'm going to go ahead and input my input bands. I'm going to use the 20 meter data. Sentinel-2 also has 10 meter data, but for our purposes, I'm just going to use the 20 meter data and input bands 5, 6, 7, 8A, 11, and 12. Uh, I've done this a number of times before recording the video. Obviously, it might require a bit of experimentation. 
Our input training polygons are that water shape file that um, we looked at previously. If you recall, the field name is class. And I'm going to call the output water.tiff. Just let that run. It takes a little bit over two seconds to complete its classification. And now let's take a look at what that looks like. This is that classified water map. I'm just going to turn this off for a second so we can better see this. I'm going to render it as a palleted categorical image. Here we can see the categories of one, two, and three. I think that's deep water, turbid water, and just the general water category. And as you can see, the classification generally worked quite well. You can see some of those narrow streams, see the different kinds of water, and I'll just confirm right now that this white area, these are all background no data values, as we can see up here. So that's perfect. Now we have an input. The only thing I'll say is that um, there's one more bit of pre-processing that I'd like to do before running the River Center Line tool, and that is to deal with some of these smaller islands within the water bodies themselves. Some of these smaller islands may well be actual islands in the, in the um, uh, image, in the area. Some of them are maybe just the result of the classification itself. So here we can get a sense of uh, what they're caused by, but regardless of what their um, genesis is, they definitely will cause issues for us because we'll end up with little bifurcations in the medial lines and the river center lines that go around each of these features. And if it's just a small single cell or a few cell sized island, then we probably don't want to overcomplicate our river center line uh, to account for these very small islands. You know, the idea of a river center line is often cartographic in nature and it's therefore better if it's generalized and doesn't include some of these smaller details. So I'm going to go ahead and use another tool that's available within the um, general tool set extension, and that is called Remove Raster Polygon Holes. And this is a tool, again, that lies within the general tool set extension. So if you purchase a, a license for the general tool set extension, you'll have access to this tool. But it does exactly what it is that we're looking to do, which is to remove um, the um, features within our water raster that are background features or islands or sometimes referred to as donut holes that are less than a certain size um, that, that we determine, uh, often from experimentation. So I'm going to call the output water no small islands tiff, it's a raster. The threshold size is the only real parameter we have to concern ourselves with. So this is in grid cells, and we're effectively saying how small of an island do we want to remove. So anything less than this threshold will be removed. Anything larger will be preserved. This, again, could probably use a little bit of experimentation to find an appropriate value, but I'm going to choose a value of 30, having done this a number of times previously. Press Run, and it does its thing. It takes a little bit less than two seconds, as we can see, and now let's visualize the output. So there's our output. Just going to take that very same um, style and apply it to our new water raster so we can get a sense of what it's done. Let's take a look. So we can see it's removed several of these smaller features, uh, which will give us a better generalization of the river center line. Some of them, of course, may be quite large islands that we perhaps want to preserve because they're significant enough that the bifurcation that happens around them is, is likely a significant feature for us. And again, if we, if we included a, a larger threshold, then even those features would disappear. Importantly, compared to some other alternative techniques for dealing with this type of um, uh, donut hole issue, like say a um, um, morphometric um, or morphological, uh, mathematical morphological operation, like say a closing, uh, this um, tool doesn't, doesn't affect the boundaries of anything other than the islands. The islands are the only things impacted by applying this tool, which is um, very appropriate for this particular application. Okay, so now we have everything we need to be able to run the river centerline tool. So I'm going to river centerline tool, and that is actually located within the hydrological analysis. So... Here it is, river center lines. 
My input is the raster that we just created, water, no small islands. The output I'm going to call centerlines.shape. The output is, in fact, a vector. That's the whole point of this, obviously. There are two parameters that we need to know a little bit about. So the first one is the minimum line length, and that's measured in grid cells. This is effectively going to determine the level of detail in the output vector. Uh, so the shorter the, the length is, this threshold is, the more detail we're going to have, the larger the value, the more generalized it will become. It will leave out some of the smaller features, particularly in areas where there are complexities in the sh outside shape of the polygon, the river polygons. Each of those can have spurs that come out from them, and, but they're typically quite short. So if we, if we uh, use a larger value, those spurs will effectively disappear. And this is probably the most important parameter in running the river centerline tool, and it may well require a bit of experimentation to find an appropriate value for a particular data set. I'm going to, however, choose a value of 25. Having run this a number of times previously, I know it generally produces a, a pretty decent output but some experimentation might be required to get a suitable value. The second parameter is the search radius. And again, this is in grid cells. So the search radius, effectively, um, this tool will join uh, polygons that are near one another where two end nodes of two raster polygons are close enough within this distance. Very often, they'll be joined along the same vector um, center line in the output. And so it effectively, uh, allows us to take particularly along those thinner streams where it may well be broken up. The, the path of the underlying water raster is actually broken up. The output vector may well join each of these smaller polygons together uh, based on the, a search distance that we set here. This search distance um, also obviously um, will, will be impacted by the value in terms of the output and likely you want to do a bit of experimentation. I would suggest values that range between about 1 and at most 10. The larger the, the value, then you may well end up making connections that don't make much sense. Uh, typically, when we are talking about these sort of thinner rivers where they might be broken up, the distance is relatively short between them, and so we can make logical connections. If we allow this radius to get very long, uh, very sh long distances will be uh, used to connect what are very distant and, and inappropriate polygons to connect. So I'm going to set the value to 5, but again, I'd recommend a bit of experimentation there. So press Run, and it should finish in a little, a little over um, 2 seconds, a little under, I guess, 3 seconds. Let's visualize that output. I called the output, if you recall, center lines, and here it is. QGIS has given it a rather inappropriate output color, so I'm just going to make it black so we have good contrast and can see, and I'm going to make it a little bit thicker so it's easier to see the output as well. So here we go. There's our output. We can see, for example, where it bifurcates around those islands that I was talking about previously. We can see where confluences come together and meet perfectly and are connected. We can see that the lines themselves are actually fairly smooth and that they follow those medial lines. Here we are in that thinner area, and we can see, hopefully, some examples of where it's made connections. Um, let's see if I can find one here, perhaps along here, where it's made connections from distant. Hmm. Having a tough time finding one. Here we are. So here you can see it's connected these two polygons that are in the underlying raster disconnected. And again, that's based on that parameter. I know, I know from having looked at this previously that there are actually loads of examples of those here. I just can't seem to spot them. Here we are. So here are some more examples. So you can see that the center line that it's uh, depicted here connects each of these um, uh, distant polygons that are otherwise um, disconnected in the underlying raster. If I turn the water raster off, we can get a sense of the of the vector that's created. So here we go. I'm just going to select some of these so you can see that they are actually quite long features. And we can see that that vector, I'd say, has done a pretty decent job. You can see some of these smaller features. They are, in fact, associated with some of the... Oops, if I perhaps 
change that color to yellow, we can add better contrast. So you can see there they are in fact water um, polygons. This would be a case where that underlying water raster uh, likely probably needs some additional cleaning up. So I would probably use other raster pre-processing methods to remove some of these smaller, I would guess they're small lakes or ponds. Um, and they, they likely don't need to be there if we don't want that level of detail. So we could obviously exclude many of them and have excluded many of them by setting an appropriate minimum length threshold. I think I set it to 25. If we increased it further then some of these other features we'd probably remove. But there are other ways in which we could process that raster in advance to, to take away those larger features, or rather many of those smaller features. But overall, I am pretty pleased with the way in which this uh, algorithm has operated to, um, to identify each of these medial center lines. So uh, I'm not saying that obviously it wouldn't require some additional um, manual digitizing or, or processing in order to, to make this into a cartographic product, but it does generally work quite well as a starting point for that type of operation. And I hope that you find this useful. So if you enjoyed this video, uh, I would say um, if you can, please uh, follow us or, or you know, leave comments um, beneath with any questions that you might have. So that's it for now. Take care, everyone, and uh, have a wonderful day.